is you've got your savings. Welcome to the Garcia Diaries podcast. I am your co-host, Bethany Garcia. And I am Anthony Garcia, the other co-host here. (laughs) Wow, you guys really, really were excited about the first one and we got such great feedback. A lot of you (laughs) were even quoting lines from the first podcast, which is, oh my gosh, it just means so much to us that you guys loved it. Yes, thank you very much for all all of your support. Uh, Just want to let you guys know, I was very nervous last time. (laughs) If you could have seen my eyes, you would have seen the blinkity blinks going on. (laughs) The twitch. But the first one is out of the way, so I feel like today I should be much, much better. Yeah. So actually, today's a very special day. It is June 7th, 2019. Which means we've officially been married for six years. And if you do the math, I'm only 23 years old, so that means I married you when I was just a, an adolescent, a minor. Yeah, you were 17 and I was 18. My mom had we to sign literally, a waiver. <laughs> I was going to say, we literally had to go to the courthouse with his mom and get a paper signed before our wedding. Thank you, Mama. But, <laughs> Mom, if you're listening to this, just go ahead and skip this episode. Yeah, this is not the one to listen to around kids. We are going to get into some deep things, right? Yeah, we're going to talk um, about marriage and what we've learned so far. We're going to talk about maybe some of our regrets or our darkest moments. Oh, we're just going to talk about our marriage up up to this point, six years, the highs, the lows. Yeah. Um, our, some of our issues. And a lot of that includes talks of SEX. So if you have kids, like I said... Um, Not the one. We really wanted to do this because countless times Bethany's gotten messages of women, men in relationships asking for advice. And although we are not... We're not experts at all. In any way, we're not perfect. We have our struggles to this day. Mm -hmm. Um, But from where we came from, I feel like we've we've made a lot of progress. I would say we're happily married, would you say? Yeah. I, I'd hope so. Well, like um, so, uh, ninety percent of the time, which I think is pretty good, right? Eighty-five. Okay, that's fine. So, but uh, before that, uh, we thought we would we would talk about a couple of things that have really been one, especially been weighing heavy on my mind and my heart. I know for my wife as well. Yeah. So last week we saw that there was a new Netflix show on and we love watching a show at night to kind of decompress after the day. Once the kids go to bed, it's kind of our thing to just, I don't know, we kind of like bond, we fold laundry and watch a Netflix show. It's our mommy and daddy time. (laughs) Yeah. That's our Netflix and chill. Netflix and chill. So it's called When They See Us and it's a new Netflix mini series. It's four episodes. And it's directed by Ava DuVernay. I think DuVernay. DuVernay. DuVernay, DuVernay. It's a cool name. Um, But she did an amazing job on this project. So, okay, Anthony is going to give you guys a little background on the story. This isn't really spoilers for the show because this is a true story. And so I'm sure you've heard of the Central Park Five. It's not like a surprise ending or like anything like that. It's literally a documentary. Uh, this is a mini series about, about an incident that occurred April nineteenth, nineteen eighty nine. A group of boys were just running around Central Park, being teenagers, being kids. But uh, a woman named Trisha Miley, I believe I said that right, was assaulted, brutally sexually assaulted, and five young men were accused, uh, uh, pretty much framed, um, and uh, Yusuf Salam, Raymond Santana. Antron McRae, Corey Wise, and Kevin Richardson are their names, uh, between the ages of 14 and 16 years old. Uh, They were accused of this crime without any actual evidence. Uh, They were detained and questioned without any adult supervision. No lawyer. No lawyers, anything. Um, Like, incredibly coerced by the police. Teenagers brought in by the police, and I'm sure back in 1989... With the racial tension, uh, it was just at that moment you you definitely feared for your life as a as an African American Hispanic teenager. Um, but they were convicted of this crime, found guilty of this crime, and served 
from anywhere from five years to 12 years. Corey Wise actually... He he served 12 years. 12 years. And I, I know all of the stories are incredibly heartbreaking and like just awful, awful, awful. But Corey Wise is the one that like even thinking about it like brings me to tears because he wasn't even in the park or like on the list of people that were supposed to be questioned. He just went to the police station with his friend Yusuf to be a good friend and look out for him. And he ends up getting the most, he served 12 years. He was 16 years old. So they stuck him in an adult prison. prison. And just the fourth episode really focuses on his time in prison. And it's incredibly hard to watch. The whole series is hard to watch. Definitely. We had to to turn it off several times and just kind of take a breath. These boys missed out uh, vital parts of their childhood into their adolescent years they didn't they didn't have anything to do with this yeah they spent time in prison and for a crime they did not commit what's crazy too is raymond santana he was 14 or 15 i think he was 15 when he went into um the juvenile center he gets out of 14 he was 14. oh wow 14 he's he gets out and gets arrested again for violating his probation and he ends up in prison as an adult and it's just crazy because he never deserved to be there in the first place and then he ends up there as an adult because through his formative years when he's learning how to be a man when he's learning how to be a human being he's in prison uh there they were released from prison and eventually their convictions were overturned well Corey Ex- wise was still in prison when the guy that actually did it came forward and confessed and it was yeah. proven with DNA evidence that, you know, he was actually the, the perpetrator. But these, these five men were released, their records were cleared, and they were actually awarded $41 million many, many years later. In 2014. Uh, which Way too freaking long later. Like, that makes me so mad, honestly. It, not enough. I, yeah. I, no dollar price will ever get back that time. Um, but actually, the part that's more frustrating for myself is that all through these years, the prosecutor maintains that she believes that they were actually guilty. Yeah, and that the guy that admitted it was just the sixth person. She literally was tweeting like last year that they're guilty. And it pisses me off because it's, I mean, I guess when you're so deep in a lie, you what, you have to keep going with it. But she's just a garbage human being. This story, this situation uh, hit home for myself in many, uh, many ways. Um, first being that I am a minority in this country. And I remember being 14 years old, running around town with my friends, doing dumb stuff that very well could have been myself in those shoes. And also as a parent to four children that are Mexican, that are minorities in this country, um, it, I shouldn't have to worry, hey, if my son were to get pulled over by the police, you know, he would yeah. be safer than my daughter Harlem, who's got the same complexion that I have. Um, I was just watching it as a mom and through that lens, and I can't imagine what those families went through, what those boys went through, but seeing it through that lens of motherhood was just devastating. I can't imagine being torn away from my child like that especially if they didn't do anything i mean in general yeah i can't imagine that but for something that they did not do it's just crazy very sad so anyways um, all that to say and and yes it's a great great series i truly hope that with this being put out there because i know for myself i had no idea about this you know you hear about the racial inequalities day in and day out um and, and it happens so often um, I feel like people are just becoming numb to it. It's just something that continues to happen every day. But uh, hopefully this this sparks a fire in, in people. More and conversation. More conversations will be had. You know, we'll, 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 we'll do more as a society to make a change. Um, and all that to say, we really, really highly recommend this series. It's called When They See Us on Netflix. It's a four-part series. So you, I mean, we binged it in one night because we were so into it and like literally stayed up till 2 a.m. It was definitely a hard watch just as far as, I mean, the story is just devastating and that was hard to get through, but it was incredibly powerful. I highly suggest it. So whenever you have a few free nights, watch When They See Us on Netflix. Yes, definitely check it out. And if you are not emotionally stirred, angered, upset, something's seriously wrong. (laughs) Go to therapy. And you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself.
So to just go from that to something a little bit lighter, you know, today is our six year anniversary of our wedding and we've been together for what, seven and a half years now total. So I wanted to ask you something. You want to ask me something? Yeah. Are you ready for it? Uh, This was not in our (laughs) pre-production meeting. I wanted to ask you a question. You have to answer this honestly. You're on the record. What has been the hardest moment in our marriage for you thus far? The hardest moment in our marriage. Now, are you asking, is this between between you and I or just moment in general? I would say, yeah, but between you and I. Has there been a moment where you think, okay, we're not, we can't come back uh, from this? To be honest, th- really the only time I ever had that thought in my head that, you know, we weren't going to last or we were going to end up getting a divorce was when we were constantly having issues fighting over the the situation with your dad Mm -hmm. because the crime he had committed in my eyes was totally against my moral values yeah well i mean obviously it's against everyone's moral values but uh, me having a relationship with him you were against it yes um and we didn't see eye to eye on that truly believe that if we didn't come to an agreement on that uh, we would not be here to this day yeah and we really did we really did compromise that situation but so that was really the only moment for myself where I feel as though that thought popped into my head I'm gonna yeah, flip that and if we hadn't both like really put an effort for that too I'm gonna flip this question Uh-oh. right back to you <laughs> yeah the hardest moment in our marriage for me a moment I feel like could have gone either way for us was sitting on our king bed in the Clovis house the year was 2015 and we had just been fighting and fighting and fighting and could not see eye to eye on so many things and if it wasn't my dad it was money and if it wasn't money it was the way you were treating me and if it wasn't the way you're treating me it was something that i was you know what i mean it was just always something and i think we had gotten in an argument about something you weren't talking to me respectfully and it was just the same old same old and i was like you know what like i'm done i'm really done with this and i told you to get your ass out sleep on the couch if you're not gonna leave and but like we're done i think that was the only time that that's actually ever been said yeah come a long way so that was 2015 let's backtrack to when we first met Okay, so as I explained in our last podcast, um, I met you when I was a freshman. You were a a fifth year senior. Shut up. I was a junior. So So, we're a year apart, but we were two grades apart. So freshman, my freshman year was Spanish class, right? Yep, Spanish. And like I said, I was upset that I was there. I sat in the back of the class. Moody as hell. You sat in front of me. All you did was talk. And I believe that freshman year, we were we friends? Yeah, I think, well, we both played basketball. And I think that we were just like in the same friend groups. No, actually, we were friends because I had a crush on your sister. Yes, okay, you're and right. And so I would talk to you. My sister was in Anthony's class in his same grade. I would talk to you to try to get closer to your sister. So that was yeah. the freshman year. And then the summer between freshman and sophomore year for you. So before I think my senior year. that's really when we got close. Got close yeah. because I would call you. He would be with his boys, his basketball buddies. And there was one in particular on his team that was, you know, trying to talk to me. But I, I think I didn't want to talk to him. So, so yeah, I would, I would try to set up like double dates when I was hanging out with him so I could hang out with your sister. Yeah, but you would call me and you'd be like, hey, will you talk to him? And I'd be like, hell no. And then you and I would just end up talking for like an hour yeah. and we just got really, really close. And then I think in the middle of the summer that year, we were on the phone and I think I made a joke about the San Francisco Giants baseball team. You made team. a joke about Buster Posey. Buster Posey. And catcher. she hung up the phone and we didn't talk again for the rest of the summer. <laughs> um, that, oh so that's that's kind of how the, the friendship started. Now, my sophomore year, you're a senior. I was a senior, yeah. Um, and by the way, okay, we went to a tiny, tiny school. There wasn't a lot of pickings. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, we were really, really close friends. And then I kind of started feeling like, oh, like, well, he's cute and he's nice and he's funny. And and so I was yeah. talking to your sister, but at the same and time, we were, okay. And we were I running cross talking, country. Remember cross yes. country? 
So I was talking to you, you and I was talking to your sister at the same time. I wasn't sure who I wanted to talk to because yeah. you were the older sister. You had a little bit more experience. I thought it'd be cool talking to a senior. So, but I also thought it was cool that I was talking to sisters. Um, oh my god, you probably told everyone. I'm talking to a pair of sisters oh, right now. Oh, my What's my up? tío Jesse definitely heard about that oh every time god. I saw him. But you called me out on it. You said you have to. You can only date one Johnson sister. Well, no, no, no. Backtrack. I think we were talking after school one time and you were like i need to tell you something and i was like don't say it (laughs) and you were like i think i have feelings for you and i was like no we're just friends and then like that weekend was when i was like if you like me like you have to choose you can't like both of us and you said i wasn't oh yeah i told you you weren't worth the drama so because it was my sister of course you weren't worth the drama (laughs) so we we stopped talking oh and also my sister didn't ever really like you not really I mean, I think she like liked the idea of liking you, but she was like at that time really intimidated by boys. Probably. Yeah. Because every time I tried to reach out to her, she <laughs> one time out. you wrote her like a long letter, and she showed me, and she was I, so she was like, "Oh my god, I don't know what to do," and I was like, "I, I didn't this have a cell phone. Biatch. I didn't have a cell phone, so yeah, the way I spit game." But the that's ladies. probably one of the times I found out like, "Oh, he's really talking to her." <laughs> but so we stopped talking. So the end of October. Yeah. I told you you weren't worth the drama and then you literally didn't talk to me. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't talk to her because obviously if I'm not worth the drama, then you're not worth the words coming out of my mouth. (laughs) So we didn't talk for like what? um, I was thinking it was three weeks. Three weeks. We didn't even look at each other in the hallway and this is a small school. So we obviously ran into each other. A few weeks later, our school had a talent show and Bethany sung a song and that song was about me. Every word from that song hit a chord in my heart yeah performed it with my dad played piano i was singing it was a song we we actually wrote and i think the lyrics were something along the lines of um i won't get to know you i won't even try i won't get to show you my sensitive side at this point i hadn't even laid it down yet and she was oh but i want to say this the name of the song okay what was the name of the song the name of the song was that's why i cry if you know the Enneagram and you know I'm a four, you'll understand that. So she sung this song after the talent show. I think we talked. Yeah, we you came up out, to me and you hugged me. And we decided, hey, let's Be friends. start talking. Yeah. Again. Um, and this was in October? No, this was November. November. Um, but we didn't actually start dating until December. Winter break. We were on the phone and Bethany is like, hey, we're pretty much boyfriend and girlfriend. Why don't you make Officially it official? ask me. And I was like, no, I'm not going to ask you to be my girlfriend over the phone and you asked me to be your boyfriend yeah i put you in that position (laughs) december 23rd no december 28th dang it december 28th (laughs) and we had already had our first kiss and all that yeah so we became official over the phone went through the senior year her senior year my sophomore year everything was great um you graduated you put me on your senior board (laughs) um you were like because i could see the future you were literally like in love with me i was in love with you and i i would say at that point i mostly lusted you you just were in it for the sex i thought i loved you but it was more lust yeah like i've never boned anyone before we were sexually active yeah so that that's where a lot of my love for you came from uh which caused problems you know later in our marriage later in our marriage yeah and that so the foundation of our relationship from my perspective from my view was sex yeah bethany obviously had a different view of our relationship yeah but well and it really comes down to as well like our love languages yours is physical touch mine's words of affirmation and i mean from day one you had that physical touch you really linked on to it and i was actually i think i was a really sweet guy in high school i said all the right things Mm-hmm. I told you what you wanted to hear. Yeah. Sweet you talker. graduate high school. You're going to play college softball. And I'm going into my junior year of high school. I break up with you because I'm not going to do the long distance relationship. I thought you were going to cheat on me with college guys. And so I broke up with you. And how did that breakup sit with you? Um, I literally cried every single day, like all day long. I tried to keep busy and hang out with my friends. My friend Gabby would come over every single night and bring me Jamba Juice and we would like look at magazines together, but nothing could get my mind off of it. And I had this deep sense just like inside of me that we were meant to be together. Obviously, we were two kids and I thought I was in love with you, but looking back, I 
I don't know. Like, I, it, it could have been something way deeper for me because I really did feel inside, like, when I thought of you. I remember telling my mom one time, like, I cannot picture my future without Anthony in it. And she said something along the lines of, well, you're a teenager and it's you're living the teenage love dream, whatever. Like, that's just how it is when you're a teenager. You think you're in love. But truly, I couldn't picture my future without you. Our breakup lasted six days. And I remember, once again, I didn't have a cell phone. So you were texting one my best friend at the time. And he set it up to where you came to one of our summer league games. Mm-hmm. And I think I was riding with him that day. Yeah, in, I confronted you outside. Confronted me outside. Um, and we got back together. We had sex in the parking lot. Yes. So <laughs> we had sex in the parking lot. We got back together. Uh, once again, not the greatest move. Fast forward... Uh, a year? Was it a year later that you got pregnant? No. Uh, okay, so that was June mm. of 2012. I got pregnant December of 2012. Wow, so not even not even a year. Yeah, so I so, started school in August, and we're obviously skipping over a lot of stuff for the sake of time, but I got pregnant December, and I finished the semester at the school I was going to, and then I transferred to Mesa Community College so that I could finish the year out there since I was pregnant. And I mean, so at the time I was 18 and you were 16 16. years old. I was halfway through my junior year in high school. The way that our birthdays are is like mine's in October and his is in February. So there's four months where we're two years apart and then the rest of the year we're only one year apart. So we find out you're pregnant, you're in college, I'm in high school. Your mom hates me. At that point, my mom did hate you. So we literally thought she was going to call the cops. My parents were prepared to hide me in Tucson. (laughs) So, uh, but from the moment we found out you were pregnant, we knew we had to figure out what we wanted to do with our lives way sooner than we expected. Yeah, but there was never a moment for me that was like, oh, should I get an abortion? Oh, should I consider adoption? Like from the moment I found out, it was like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. Like this is my life. This is God's plan for me. And this is my baby. Like whether you were in it or not, I don't know. I never felt like you weren't in it. Like I felt, I never had a moment in my pregnancy where I felt like, oh, he might leave he might give up on them and us. and for sure from day one i knew that i was going to be the father that my biological father was not to myself and i knew i had to man up step to the plate and and take care of my child and also i know this sounds really dumb but i grew up in a religious family we went to church um and i remember i always had this thought in the back of my mind like if you have a kid out of wedlock your kid will be a bastard child yeah um and so that was ingrained in and, both of us yes being religious that like are, you are, don't have a child out of wedlock exactly you don't. or that you know if you have that kid when you're not married then that child will be cursed so we decided that we needed to get married um so 17 years old and our parents both i mean i don't feel like they pressured it but they they definitely both wanted us to get married yes both of our parents to do it in the right way yeah quote yeah. unquote in the church's eyes even though we didn't I didn't go to church at yeah, that I didn't point. Didn't go to church either. <laughs> um, but so, seventeen years old, we get married. Yeah, you were seventeen. I was eighteen. June seventh, two thousand thirteen. I was six months pregnant with Brooklyn. But I, I think maybe three months before that is when we first moved in together. Yeah, we got our six hundred and nine square foot apartment. No, 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 no. It was seven hundred square. Fourteen. Seven hundred and fourteen square foot apartment. And but it was six hundred and nine dollars a month. A month. You're three months pregnant when we move in together. You, your family was pretty well off um, at the time. At that time. And. But our, my family was majorly struggling because my dad was in the midst of a couple, you know, scandals that we can get into at a later time. You lived a pretty yeah. comfortable life up to that point. You had your own bedroom for crying out loud. <laughs> Which was like crazy to him. Uh, before I moved out of the house, there was four of us in one bedroom. We had two bunk beds. So you, you know, your, your family had a six bedroom, four bathroom house with a pool and a spa and a basketball court. And I moved into this little tiny so you're one living, bedroom. Your living standards were way up here. My living standards were already low. Um, So you kind of, you stooped down to my level. Yeah. And you thought we were living good. Like you were like, oh, we got our own place. Like this is cool. Yeah. So I, I was definitely proud of what we had at that point. Even though I was working at a grocery store, mm-hmm. you were working retail. We didn't have a lot of money. But I felt like, hey, we're married. We have our own place, a a place to bring our daughter to when she comes home. So we're mostly proud that we weren't living with like our parents or grandparents or anything. Um, Early on. I think the first marriage problems we really, really had was 
money financial we know i would say mental health mental health because i was really going through i was struggling majorly i had even through my pregnancy i had anxiety and i mean i've always struggled with anxiety since i was a child but i was depressed i was anxious it was the stuff with my dad that my family was going through it was you know being pregnant and all the hormones of that and it was just being married at such a young age everything i felt the world was crushing down on me and i literally was was breaking down yeah breaking down and for myself i had no idea what anxiety was how to deal with mental health i was raised hey you suck it up and you keep going or if you're scared that, you pray about it yeah mental health is for white people yeah or that o- kind of only stuff. white people have mental health you know or um, have mental health issues have mental yeah. health issues <laughs> so i was i had no understanding of it i didn't believe in it i thought it was all on her head so i was real just rude about it i didn't listen to you well, you need to do this. You need to do that. Or, you know, I was always trying to give you recommendations on what to do to fix it. And I didn't truly understand it. Yeah. So I remember because at this point I had gotten a job at UPS. So I was working overnights into the early morning. And I remember getting phone calls from you freaking out because yeah, there, was a, there was a helicopter outside shining its light into the neighborhood and you're freaking out. And, and because and not the just ghetto birds out, but, up in yeah. the air. But literally like trembling on my knees, cannot move, shaking because I've never, first of all, I've never been alone in an apartment and I'm in a strange part of town that I've never lived in before. Like I, before I moved straight from there from a house with six people on it, you know, I was just ridden with fear. And I would be like, why are you calling me? You should be asleep right now. You know, you're pregnant. You need to take care of your baby. So I'd come home from work and we would sleep all day. Mm -hmm. Mind you, at this point, it's still my junior year in high school. I was doing some online schooling. Um, No. Yeah, I was going to the school downtown Mesa. it was summer, but yeah. Okay. But I was I was still in high school. So I'm working a full-time job, married, and still in high school. So I'm still trying to find myself while also trying to figure out <laughs> how to this, have a family this family stuff yeah so that was early on and then a big thing for me was the the money the finances yeah you weren't working yeah i was bringing in the income wasn't a lot of money yeah because once i once i really started getting pregnant i quit my job and i really wanted to be a stay-at-home mom at that point so the the money was a big thing paying our bills Will, will, the, will the bills get paid? But the biggest thing at that time was the situation with your dad. At that time, we were in the midst of all of the things that he did that he would eventually be arrested for, and he's in prison now. But he he is in prison for sexual exploitation of a minor. And so all of those things going through that, I was 18 years old, pregnant. I had siblings that I loved and cared for younger than me that were in the house with him. My mom, like it was just... Ugh, it was a hor- it, it was a horrible time for me. And so Bethany was was really involved in that situation. She wanted to be there for her family and I was totally against it because to- Well, I feel like we'll get we we should get into that in a, at a different time because that will just take up the next three yeah, hours. Yeah, but I was but, totally against it. Yeah, I, so I that was a big she fight. Should have cut off all ties with him, especially with us a few months away from having our own child, and we would literally have fights because she, when I was at work, she went over to her parents' house and something happened over there that made her upset. So then she would come home and try to vent that to me, and I'm like, hey, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. So it would turn from her trying to express her emotions to myself. Yeah to me saying hey well i don't i don't think you should have been there anyway so i don't want to hear about it yeah i don't care and And it would just escalate into these huge fights and you would leave and i would be sitting there crying and it yeah it was there was so many fights that went like that um so that that was the big the biggest thing but also the sex you're pregnant your body's going through all of these changes yeah. morning sickness i didn't want you to touch me and she and so you know six months ago we were having sex every day to now you don't want me to touch you so i i took that personal i didn't understand what happens to a woman's body when she's pregnant the changes i took that personal and literally i'd say let's have sex and you'd be like no i don't feel like it and i'd walk out of the house yeah and i also feel like for me there was a lot of shame um and guilt for even having sex with my husband like i felt shame and guilt just because of the way i was raised it was like oh you can only have sex with your husband and 
well, I had sex before marriage, so I didn't deserve to have sex and I didn't deserve to feel good. And there was just all these underlying emotions from, I feel like, just religion and how religion views sex. And that was that took a long time for me to overcome. I would say definitely a few years. So year one, we don't have any money. We're dealing with the issue with your dad. We don't have sex. We're not off to a great start. There's no communication between us. We don't know how to talk to each other. In my head, our leash is up. We have a little bit more money. We're going to be able to move to a bigger apartment and all of our problems will go away because we'll have more space. We'll have nicer things. Yeah, I mean, we're going through all of these things. Not to mention we're young. We have a new baby. Then I find out I'm pregnant and didn't even know you could get pregnant that fast. Brooklyn was three months old. So it was just all a lot and we definitely thought moving to a bigger place would solve all of our problems and Anthony had a better job so we moved and I was also babysitting a lot to for extra money and (laughs) things just got worse and worse and worse. I felt like you were mean to me all the time and like little tiny things would turn into full-blown fights and it was every single day. And I think at this point we didn't know how to communicate our problems. No, yeah, we so literally... So we knew something was wrong, but we didn't even know where to start to start dealing with these issues. Mm-hmm. Time passes. We were still having issues. It's hard to admit this, but I, I truly, you know, I was verbally abusive. I was rude. I knew which buttons of yours to push. Two kids in two years. I'm sure you're, at that point, your body was going through crazy emotions and changes that I couldn't comprehend but I didn't see any of that and you know you would you would always say hey you you shouldn't treat me like that or talk to me in that way Mm -hmm. and what was my response all the time he would say when I was growing up I saw husbands beat their wives as at least I'm not doing that to you I saw that in my own home yeah my my parents would literally beat on each other so I thought hey I'm not like my parents yeah I don't put my hands on you you shouldn't have any problem with the way I treat you, which was totally wrong. So, (laughs) you know, fast forward to 2015, that's, this is how our marriage has been for a year and a half or so, or almost two years. And beginning of 2015, I'm at my breaking point and I'm just done. And that verbal and mental abuse was so freaking hard. Finally, I just, I don't know what it was, but I found the courage to stand up for myself for the first time. And I started standing up for myself and just like constantly. And anytime you would do something, I would push back. I just started fighting for myself and just really being brave and courageous enough to say like, I don't deserve this. And after one big fight in 2015, I was done. And I told him, I'm like, get out. Like, we're done. I'm not doing this anymore. I deserve better. The kids deserve to not see their mom being treated like this. At the time, Brooklyn and Harlem were... Harlem was a baby and Brooklyn was one. But yeah, I was like, (laughs) enough is enough. And I kicked you out and kicked your ass all the way out of the couch. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, that was the first time in our relationship that I truly felt that you were serious. And I know it sounds like I was the root of all of our problems. And to be brutally honest, I truly believe I was. Because every time we'd have a fight, every time something happened, whether it was my fault, whether it was your fault, you would always apologize. You know, you would always find some way to put blame on yourself. So that, you know, that's how it always ended. And that's how everything transitioned back to good because you took responsibility for everything. Yeah. Um, And this was the first time that you had actually stood up for yourself. I knew you were serious. But in that moment, I said, okay, fine. I'll go lay on the couch then. So at that point, what's going through your head? I've like literally told you that I'm done and I've never done that before. What's going through your head? The reality set in that I could potentially lose my family, lose the opportunity to spend all of my time with my children that I may may have to share them with someone that doesn't live in my home. That was huge for myself because I'd always said that when I had children that I would do whatever I could in my power to ensure that I at least attempted to have a successful relationship with their mother. We weren't having a successful relationship because of the way I treated you. So I just sat on the couch. I didn't want to lose you. I love you. You're my high school sweetheart. I literally grew up and growing up with you. You're all I know. Yeah. And I, I just didn't want to lose, lose any of it because I felt like what we had was precious. So I went back into the room, maybe got a little teary-eyed, 
and I think I just said I'm sorry. What do I need to do to be better? What do I need to do to to change your mind? Mm -hmm. And that's when you just kind of laid it all out there for me. Yeah. And those five hours that you were out on the couch, I was planning what exactly, like I think I wrote down everything that I needed to be different in order for us to stay married. It, It didn't change right away. Like the next morning, it wasn't different, but it slowly every single day got better and we moved in a better direction. I really had to do some soul searching. I really had to sit back and examine myself. And instead of looking at all, all your flaws and the things that I thought you did wrong, I had to tell myself, you know, what what can I do to, to make things better? Instead of what can you do? Yeah. So I, I started taking initiative, doing things, um, and really just watching what I said. And I think too, like we made rules that like when we're in the midst of an argument like we don't leave and we we actually had to to kind of set rules no leaving because from very early on in our relationship would just leave get in the car drive around the block or just go get in the car Um, in my head i thought i was diffusing the situation but for you yeah i felt like you were abandoning me i i just felt like we were supposed to stay together and work it out you know so that was that was a big one no leaving and i actually told you to call me out more if in there's ever a moment where i'm doing something wrong or i feel you know you're you're feel like i'm treating you the wrong wrong way i told you hey call me out in that moment yeah so that way hey either i no, I'm being a dick, change it, or maybe I don't even realize I'm being a dick in that moment. Well, the other thing that was kind of off was, you know, my, after having two babies, like my libido was shot to hell and I didn't want to have sex at all. And I didn't want you to touch me and I didn't feel like turned on ever. And we decided to explore ways. Yeah, because I wanted to have sex. I wanted that intimate part of my relationship back with my husband, but I just like felt so lost (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> I think because of the way I was raised it was that like sex is bad blah 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 Anthony came home one night with this little bag this gift bag and said he had a present for me and I open it up and it's a vibrator and I'm like what the hell is this and he's like I thought maybe you, you know we could try it during sex and see like see if that helps you at all so <laughs> we you know we had this conversation we agreed that we're going to change things. I'm so desperate to get laid, I turned to my handy, trusty source, Google, and was like, hey, my wife doesn't want to have sex with me. What <laughs> what the heck can I do? And it was like, try sex toys. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no way, only like creeps use sex toys. But that was just like our mentality, I guess. So I, yeah. I walked into the sex store. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine you. Can I see your ID, sir? It was really <laughs> weird. And just kind of pick something out. I'm pretty sure you like asked for someone's opinion. No. I thought you asked the lady. Mm, you didn't talk to anyone? No. Oh my gosh. Nobody. <laughs> I found this really cool one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, he gets home and I'm like, nope, 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 not going to do it. And he's like, come on, like, let's just try it. Come on, like, please, like, we're... <laughs> please and then he started bawling his eyes no i'm just kidding (laughs) but you've never seen me bawl my eyes out first of all anyways so he we tried it and literally from that moment on in our marriage i can't think of a time like where our sex life hasn't been good since then it's like it like lit a fire yeah in your vagina sometimes it's like get off of me (laughs) yeah like it really really helped my sex drive even through baby number three and through baby yeah because then right after this we got pregnant with deuce and then through that pregnancy through after deuce and then through bronx like we my sex drive stayed it didn't plateau like it was all good because as i got fatter and fatter (laughs) i got slower and slower oh my god (laughs) and trusty old spotter won't ever let you down oh my god So the crazy thing is that I recently read a study that said that men orgasm about 95% of the time during Ah! sex. Stop. (laughs) During sex and women orgasm 69% of the time. And that was kind of crazy to me because, I mean, first of all, why do men deserve more orgasms than women? In the whole sex toy arena, it's funny too because I actually had someone during a Q&A ask, like, how do you, like, help your sex drive after kids? And I 
put on my story and I said, DM me for a link. And I got literally like 300 messages from women saying, send me the link, send me the link. Like I'm desperate. And what I suggest is this brand called Backstreet Toys. You can get it on Amazon. It's $20 and they have free two day shipping. So get on it right now. But these little vibrators are amazing and you like actually use it during sex. It's not, I mean, I'm guess you can use it by yourself, but it's something for us that we like use during to just make my experience a little bit better. Edge. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, but uh, fellas. And oh, by the way, I will add the link to Backstreet Toys in our show notes because I know you guys are all going to like die for it. It truly hurt my pride walking into a sex store and looking for sex toys because... Because you n- felt like you couldn't do that I, on your own. I, on my yeah. own, exactly. But, fellas, I would just recommend if you're having if sex If your wife problems, is having trouble, yes. you, you know, and like doesn't have that sex drive and but she wants, like obviously don't pressure her because your body goes through a lot of changes after giving birth and it takes a while to even be like her to even have the energy sometimes but like if she's wanting to have get her sex drive back like so many women that follow me that's definitely an option and you know what doesn't hurt your pride what clicking order on amazon <laughs> versus having to walk For into sure. a store and like feel shamed by people and like people it, are watching exactly you. it's, it's kind of weird i mean even how many fellas out there even going to the grocery store trying to buy con- condoms it's weird because you got to go find this dorky person <laughs> up at the front and be like hey <laughs> can you pop the cage open for me so i can get some condoms um but just put that pride down um even if you have a great sex life that stimulation that happens to the to my wife it just kind of okay i think we're getting a little (laughs) too in detail right now fellas give it a go because even if you're not having sexy problems or you don't think if you think you're laying it down i'm sure spicing it up in the bedroom um will just kind of push it over the edge um and i would imagine i would think most men are driven by sex so sex toys really saved our sex life no like seriously i tell everyone that i tell literally everyone that i feel that sex toys or vibrators saved our sex life which kind of in turn saved our marriage but you also like all those changes that you made beth loves anal beats oh my god i've (laughs) shut up That is not no, true. No, but okay. So all jokes aside, our sex life is going strong. Um, we're we talking so, about 2015. Yeah. So sex life's on the the up. You know, we're the going up, 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 up. And now I'm more, even though it's selfish. I'm selfish in hindsight. I'm even more open to listening to you. Well, I I don't even know if it was because of the sex or just in general of us. Like we were like a unit. Like we were communicating better. You really wanted to change, and I wanted to also. Like I wasn't perfect at all. I'm still not. And we just wanted to work together to have a great marriage. And we wanted to. We made that conscious decision together that every single day we were going to put effort in. I started to read articles on what is anxiety. Yeah. You, you would send me links. Yeah. Um, I did research myself, and I learned what triggered you, what pushed you over the edge. Yeah, and, and how so- to help me. And he, and he actually is the one that encouraged me to get on medication because I hadn't been on it ever in my life, and I should have been on it since I was in high school, probably, but... Yeah, he was the one that encouraged me to actually get on medication. And once I did, I mean, that just changed even more for us. I just was happier in general. And I think if I had been on meds our entire marriage, I don't know if I would have like been done earlier or if I would have been able to like stand up earlier and say like no more of this or I mean I don't know what would have changed but I wouldn't really trade anything of what we went through because I think it taught us so much and especially for you being so I mean you're younger than me and being so young like you had so much to learn about even how to treat women and be a father be a husband and all these things happening at once exactly everything happened at once so I was learning all these new parts of life, yeah, ways of life. We 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 started to get on the same page. Yeah, I kn- I felt like I've always knew you. You've always known me. I've always known you. I knew what you liked, things like that. But I've actually started to understand what what's going on in your head. Yeah. Um. And that brought us way closer. Way together. closer together because I was aware of what yeah. what's going on. That makes sense. Um. I've never. I don't think you'll fully ever understand until you've been through. Well, because you know? when I have anxiety, I just blink. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know we were we were on the same page and then you know i'm getting i got pregnant with deuce gave birth to him and then he's diagnosed with this big scary word craniosynostosis we've never heard of it in our lives we don't know what's going to happen our infant baby two-month-old baby has to have brain surgery essentially and i feel like that was a defining moment in our marriage that could have torn us apart or brought us closer together the, the situation with deuce i mean it brought us closer than ever closer than peanut butter and jelly <laughs> and it's just been up from there i've learned to watch my tongue to this day i still get in you know upset moods and yeah i feel like everyone goes through like moods and i'm not but... perfect but you do a really good job of hey if i'm in a mood to pick a fight you'll just walk away yeah and be like I don't hey deal with it. you're being dumb now <laughs> like, whereas whatever. before you would literally be kneeling down trying to figure out why i was upset yeah um and that that actually helps because you stand up for yourself now and i think that's important is male female you need to stand up for yourself yeah you know no one deserves to be treated like the gum on the bottom of the chinese buffet dining table so you stick up for yourself now when i get upset because you didn't oh fuck what was the last fight we just had the other day chick-fil-a is really stupid yeah um what am I trying to say? Oh, because Chick-fil-A got our order wrong. And so you told me to go inside and fix it. And I went inside and there was a long line. So I came back out and I was like, I just, it's whatever. No, you were like, I'm not going to wait in that line. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? I want my large waffle fries. <laughs> <laughs> and I like slammed the door and he's like, get back in the car. <laughs> Don't you slam my door. <laughs> Uh, but you know now we still have dumb fights. and then like literally so like we're, we were like heated over something so dumb this was a few weeks ago and five minutes later we're literally like laughing because it was so stupid we just i think we both can just like turn it off and be like oh my we're, god as if but we were able to recognize like hey yeah. i'm wrong yeah you're probably wrong and i was but, like are you gonna apologize and he's like are you gonna apologize and i was like no <laughs> whereas a few years ago those waffle fries would have been a fight for seven days, days. yeah being able to recognize those things and in the moment realize hey we're wrong let's let's stop yeah. luckily none of the kids were with us yeah so that conversation that happened almost four and a half years ago over four and a half years ago um everything's like been upward since then and obviously there's like marriage it's full of like hills and mountains and one day you're up one day you're down but i really feel like we've only gone up words since then which is great because you know and now we have four kids and we're still so young and we've but we've been married six years i don't know like i'm just i'm in a place right now where i'm just really grateful for how far we've come and how much you've changed because i do think that a lot of people like get married and they think oh well i'm like i'm gonna stay the same but like i've always encouraged growth with you and myself like i'm never content exactly and i'm always wanting to just i want more i want more so like i think it was two years ago like you had changed so much you would you're an amazing husband and like doing all these things right and i think you did something and i was like i don't like that and you were like like i've changed so much like what more do you want me to do and i'm like there's always more you can do like there's always more things you can change there's always ways to better yourself and I feel like that's always been a theme for me that I'm just like, there's exactly. always and, more. And I always want to be better for you mm -hmm. and be the best man that I can be. Yeah. Um, and what always sticks in the back of my mind is the way that I treat my wife, what I want my daughter's husbands to treat them that way. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I live by is would I be okay with someone talking to my daughter like that yeah. or saying that to, to them so and now you're like freaking the better person in this relationship like i was the better person when we started I don't know about and now i that. like suck at every i'm a better i'm a better housewife but I don't know if <laughs> yeah I much no you're marriage. honestly like the how you've grown in the past few years and like matured and stuff it's crazy like you're you're just an incredible husband and i feel like i can always talk to you i feel like you're always supportive of me i feel like we're just like we just sink and vibe and yeah thank you very much you're a pretty okay half-ass housewife I, <laughs> myself. But no it's been amazing this journey is far from over we've got lots of stories we've truly it's truly been a roller coaster yeah um but i think that's that's all made for who we are today yeah it's been we've been through a lot but it's all been so worth it to so, get to this point to paraphrase i was a dick
Bethany's been perfect. Oh my God. Um, and I'm sure many of you guys can relate that, you know, per- marriages aren't perfect. Four and a half years ago, Bethany and I were on the verge of a divorce. So hasn't always been gumdrops and lollipops. <laughs> um, and we just hope that by sharing a bit of our story, hopefully it made sense to you guys that um, if you are having relationship problems, that you know maybe you can grab a hold of something we said and use it in your own lives. And whether that be sitting down, having a conversation with your significant other, looking to get professional help or spicing up your uh, <laughs> bedroom. Spicing it up in the bedroom. Toys. <laughs> um, do it. Yeah, um, do it. Because it's so worth it. But make sure you get on the same page with your significant other. I think that's one of the biggest complaints I hear from women that follow me and message me is that they don't know how to get through to their partner. So I think really sitting down and having those conversations. I also highly recommend therapy because having a mediator really helped us. And so I really think that that could help. But it's always always good to have that third party. Um, so all that to say, we obviously have so many more stories to tell. And we're so excited that you guys are here listening to it. And we, we I, I loved that we got to share this story on this day because... I think on Instagram stories and on my blog, it's like that highlight reel of like, we're always having fun. And like, we do have a great relationship now to where we pretty much are always having like a good time, but it has not always been like that. And so I think taking that veil off and showing the... (laughs) the real past of us it's probably probably shocking to a lot of people too because a lot of people just don't see that side of us and they just see like the funny foodie anthony of like always making jokes and stuff and you worked really really hard to become this person and i'm working every day yeah every day to get better that's something to be proud of thank you (laughs) that was so western you're like well (laughs) thank you (laughs) but yeah six years of marriage for us it's been totally worth it. Yeah. I love you. I love you too. So if you're Are we going to end every podcast like being sappy toward each other? Because mm-hmm. you're trying to get laid after every single time. That's my goal. <laughs> every second of every day. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys have any questions, any concerns, you want to tell us your stories, go ahead and reach out to the Garcia Diaries. Thank you for tuning in. We are on Spotify. We're now on Apple Podcast. So subscribe if you don't have either of those you can just go to the garciadiaries.com and we have show notes every monday a new episode drops and so we are so excited hey and shout out to the lady in the chick-fil-a drive-thru line (laughs) 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 that said she can recognize my man bun anywhere she's like i love your podcast (laughs) we're like what (laughs) hit us up let's grab lunch sometime Uh, all right and if you're in do you hear our kids right now They're supposed to be all sleeping. (laughs) And that's where we leave you. Peace.